Hi, my name is Sustino Mora. I'm a UCLA student and also a leader of the California Dream Network. And today we have attorney Jessica Dominguez to answer some of the questions um, that we have been getting in the last couple of weeks that pertain to the deferred action application. Thank you, Sustino. I'm glad to be here. Today we're going to be um, going over the different applications um, on deferred action. The first one is Form I-821D. The second application is I-765. And the last application is I-765. WS. And um, just for this video, we're going to be focusing on the first application, which is I-821D. Uh, so for question one on the application, we have been getting a lot of questions from people. Um, they don't know what to put because they have you know, a la their last names. So what should, what should they write on this section? The best answer is use the names that you were given on your birth certificate. As you know, in many of our countries, we use two different last names, yes. our mother's last name and our father's last name. So use the last names that appear on your birth certificate. That's the best answer. On the next question is question 2A. Um, I have met many, many students who are minors. They're under 18, they're, um, you know, they have their parents, and they're wondering, do they really have to put their parents' name on uh, question uh, 2? Not necessarily. This address can be used by those that, for example, they know they're moving or they have some issues in receiving their correspondence at the address where they actually reside at, uh -huh. and they can use someone else's address for purposes of mailing. Or those people that are being represented by an attorney, the attorneys are also using their address there. Sounds great. And then on the second um, page of the application, many people have uh, questions um, about question five which is asking to provide a social security number. So what should people put on this section if they ever worked with a uh, fake uh, social security number? Justino, as the question reads, number five, US social security number. Yes. If you don't have one, you don't need to include one. If you made up a number that you could use for work purposes, you don't need to write that number down because it hasn't been given to you by the US social security office. Does that apply even to those who use a relative's, uh, relative's social security number? Absolutely, because it is not your social security number. If you don't have one, don't include it. And what about those that um, are using a ITIN number to file taxes? Excellent question. Again, same answer. You don't need to include it because an ITIN number is not a social security number. The only number that should be written in this answer is that number that has been given to that person who actually was issued a social security card by the U.S. Social Security Office. That couldn't be any clearer. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, on the question is on the same page, question nine, it asking for country of residence. What should they put on this section? USA. That is the only answer that I can tell you it's automatic as part of that of this application because everyone who applies for defraction must reside in the United States. So the answer to question number nine is USA. Thank you. And then on the next question is um, question 12. Uh, many students like myself, when we were in school, um, they accidentally wrote a different name um, and maybe it meant other, others have used different uh, names. So is it required to provide those additional names um, on this section? First and foremost, if we have any type of records where we know that the institution made a mistake, yes. the best thing to do is take your time, go back to your school mm -hmm. and have them fix that record. That is really easy to do. they probably take at the most two weeks. Yes. Why? Because we don't want to confuse the immigration officer who's going to be reviewing your package, right? Yes, we right. want to make it as easy as possible for them. And specifically, you're asking me, what about if they have different names? We have to analyze that. Why are there different names being given? Yes. Uh -huh. now? If a person, for example, graduated from high school over 10 years ago, uh -huh. and in order to work, they use somebody else's name, yes. the entire evidence has to be analyzed. For example, why are they going to register evidence with somebody else's name on it? Is there any other way that you can prove the past five years of continuous residence in the U.S.? Bank accounts would be able to prove that Definitely. with your name on, that, on them. So I suggest that before you decide to include any evidence that has someone else's name that you have someone analyze the reason why you want to submit that. Question th 13 on the application, which is on page two, um, is asking for the date of initial entry. Um, do we really have to put the exact date when we came into the U.S.? No, you can estimate that date. And if you ask the parents, many of the parents know, but a lot of the dreamers who are a little bit older, they don't Literally. remember and they don't have a way to sometimes get that information. So an approximate date would be helpful, month and year. 
I have a lot of friends who already graduated from college. They have a master's degree, a doctorate degree. So mm -hmm. I'm one, and they have asked me a lot of questions. Uh, what should I put on question number 18? Do I need to put that I graduated from university? We go back to the requirement. What is the requirement? The requirement is either to have your high school diploma, the equivalent, or being in school to either obtain your high school diploma or your GED, correct? Uh -huh. So the answer right. here, if you're a high school grad, that's where you write down, high school grad. If you have your GED, then you write down general education development. That's very <laughs> straightforward. Um, so we move on to page uh, number three, and this is um, uh, the, the section where they ask for the different addresses where we have resided since we came in uh, to the United States. And many um, of those students, including myself, <laughs> we moved many of those times. We lived in more than seven different places. So wh what should we do if we don't remember uh, most of those uh, different addresses? Thankfully, you're not going to get penalized for not remembering. Yeah. That is the good news. However, what I would recommend is review the evidence that you're going to be submitting. Based on that evidence, let's say you have a medical record yes. with an address on uh -huh. it that you were residing there three years ago, then that address should definitely be included. Okay. If you are submitting a high school transcript and the address is there, well, it's going to be easy for you to remember. Definitely. But you don't have to go back till back you know, 10, 20 years ago. If you don't remember, <laughs> you don't remember. Yes, Just okay. use the information that you already have as the evidence that's going to be registered. Sounds great. Um, and then, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Many, many students have um, stepped out of the U.S. And, and then came back. So there's a lot of confusion um, along those lines because we have to, uh, you know, b prove that we have been living in the U.S. continuously since June 15, 2007. W what can you tell um, th those students? Here is where you most get all the evidence that you have with f to prove those five years, from mm -hmm. June 15th of 2007 to June 15th of 2012. Why? Let's just say you had a brief absence from the U.S. You had an emergency, you had to go visit uh, an ill relative, but it was a brief absence. Uh -huh. How can you prove that it was brief? Because sometimes people don't have, come on, airplane tickets. They didn't <laughs> leave and come back, yes. right? Mainly the exits were brief and casual. So how do we prove that? By the other side, of the coin, meaning, uh -huh. where are your roots in the United States? Yes. Have you been going to school all these years? Do you have bank accounts? Have you been paying taxes? If your roots are here in the US, that is good enough for you to show continuous physical presence. And a brief casual absence is not gonna give enough information to immigration for them to deny your application. Having said that, my recommendation would be to everyone that is watching this video to remember that CIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services, the director, Alejandro Mayorkas, yes. has told mm -hmm. us that it's going to be case by case basis. So if anyone has any exits, that is something that should definitely be analyzed. Thank you so much. That was very, uh, that clarifies a lot of the questions. And I'm yeah. going to be sharing this information with uh, my friends and with community members. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the next page, uh, it's uh, page four. This is a really extremely uh, important section because it relates to, you know, someone's uh, criminal record. And many people have a lot of questions um, on question number one, um, which asks um, and relates to minor traffic violations. So many people have, um, you know, gotten different tickets for driving without, without a license. So um, can you please cl clarify some of those uh, concerns and questions? Absolutely. And I always tell the people that are asking this specific question yes. to go back to the question itself. Uh -huh. So let's look at question number one of part three, page four. It says, have you ever been arrested, charged or convicted of a felony or misdemeanor in the U.S.? And it tells us do not include minor traffic violations, minor driving with a license, um, <laughs> that only resulted in a fine unless it was alcohol or drug related. So even though the person knows that it was, let's say, a traffic violation or an infraction that had to do with drugs or alcohol, yes. you must, you must disclose that. However, before you even disclose it, I do recommend that the person has that evidence analyzed by an immigration attorney who's an expert in the matter yes. before you apply. Because we know, for example, if any of you are filling out this application and mm -hmm. you have yes to this answer, you should not be submitting your uh, package for diffraction unless an attorney has already analyzed it. And as yes. you know, community-based organizations such as CHIRLA, yes. they have forums almost on a weekly basis and attorneys are attending these forums so that we can answer the questions of those people attending. So my recommendation would be don't rush, uh -huh. take your time, wait for you to be able to attend a forum <laughs> that, like the ones that CHIRLA are, are having and in that way you can have your documents analyzed. Sounds great. 
Um, what about if someone has a, a criminal record and they're not really sure if they have anything on their record, what should they do? They can get a copy of their Department of Justice record or also the FBI record just by yes. taking their fingerprints. A lot of community-based organizations <laughs> are also taking these prints and they're not that expensive to get. And let's say, once you get back your records, uh -huh. once you get back your prints, they're clean. I don't want you to jump up and down and be like, okay, great, I'm clean, I don't have anything. If you know that you've been arrested, if you know that you've had an issue with the police in the past, the best advice is, for you to go and get those records, you must remember where they were. Come on, you're young, you have good memories. <laughs> and once you can have those records in hand, then have them analyzed. Yeah, so it's better to do this right the first time. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of people who have gotten tickets and they haven't paid those tickets. Um, what should they do? Should they just wait, pay those tickets? Those tickets pay them, pay them. First, go and find out, go to the court and yeah. find out what was the outcome of that not payment of the ticket because some of them turn into misdemeanors yes. and warrants for people's arrests. So we don't want you to go and take your fingerprints when Citizenship and Immigration Services sends you the notice and for them to be notified that you have a warrant for your arrest. And it's an issue very easy to resolve if you go and pay your ticket. Mm -hmm. And of course, if there's a warrant, you need to know that you should speak to an attorney before you go and get arrested. Definitely. Remember, there's no deadline. It's better if you uh, fix your case, have everything in order so you can apply um, and submit this application without having anything that might um, put your application in jeopardy. Good advice. Really good advice. There's, um, I have a, a lot of uh, people who have been asking me questions about what if they had a juvenile record? Um, is that something that might disqualify them from applying to deferred action? That's an excellent question. My answer to that would be, for immigration purposes, if they had a juvenile issue, it shouldn't be a conviction for purposes of immigration laws. However, there are some minors that were convicted as adults. Before registering your package for deferred action, yes. my advice would be for an attorney to analyze those documents. It is important to remember that this is an application for discretionary relief. What this means is that USCIS may consider this evidence before they make a decision on the case. Remember, they have told us case by case, case by case. Now we're moving on to page uh, five of the application. Um, a lot of people are going to community organizations, to attorneys, to uh, you know help them out to fill out this application. Um, so what should they do um, on page five of the application? The person who's preparing this information on behalf of the applicant must include their information here as part of this package. And of course, question number seven as, uh, on page five is for them to sign this as well. It must be signed and it must be dated. Mm -hmm. And if they're using an interpreter, that interpreter has to include their information as well. Okay, sounds great. And lastly, the last uh, page of the application, um, it, it asking, it's asking for additional information. So what type of information should they include on page six of this application? If, they were, if you answer any of the questions on pages one through five and you did not have enough space, yeah. for example, for the addresses, uh -huh. that is the only reason that you should be using this page. Attorney, do you have any general recommendations as to um, applying for the deferred action? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> the <laughs> first recommendation yes. I have, Justino, is and he's my witness. I have not just a package for my applications for the I-21D, I-765, and the I-765WS, but uh, as part of my package for me, uh, that I carry with me every day, are the instructions. Yes. Every single page of the instructions is really important to me because I have to tell you, I believe that USCIS has made this a very easy process for us to follow. Wouldn't you agree? I agree, definitely. The questions are very easy to understand. The instructions are there. Of course, there are always going to be some questions, and yes. that's why we have your organization to be able to get this information out to the community. Mm -hmm. But the information that's given under every single one of the instructions, it's, it's very, very helpful. For example, most of us, when we're filling out applications, if we don't have an answer to the question, mm -hmm. we write either not applicable or none, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But as part of the instructions, we read, no, you leave a blank. Don't say none, don't answer not applicable, just leave it blank. Mm -hmm. And what color um, of ink should you be using when you're filling out the applications? Black, don't use any other color such as pink or yellow. That's right, and <laughs> if I had done this on my own, I think I would be using pink, but 
<laughs> as you said, it's one of the first instructions to use black ink. So it, it instructions, very little instructions like that. Many people in our community were concerned, do I have to go and get my passport? And yes. USCIS has not clarified, no, as long as you give us a photo ID, we don't need you to register a passport. So I think that my main recommendation would be follow the instructions and don't rush. Take your time. This is not the time for you to think Never. that you have an immediate deadline. Take your time to collect the documents and in that way you can have a very nicely prepared package and I recommend a table of contents. Definitely that's a table of contents, it's really important because what I want you and everyone out there to think is if you are the immigration officer reviewing this package uh -huh. and you get a package that's all out of order, yes. are you going to mm -hmm. want to finish that or do you want to go to the one that looks very nicely tabbed, all the information is there, right? I think I would put it to the side. <laughs> right. So that's my main recommendation. Just pretend that you're the one reviewing this and make it as easy as possible and complete the information according to the evidence that you're registering as well. Thank you so much for uh, answering my questions and for clarifying many of our concerns. This concludes video one of going over the first application uh, for applying for um, deferred action. And remember to go to uh, trusted community organizations that will be able to help you apply for this process. One of them is Cherla, another one is the California Dream Network, and there's also other national organizations that are there to help you um, apply for this process. One of them is United We Dream. Remember, you can get that information um, through the web, through our websites, through our Facebook fan pages, and also through Twitter. So, you know, just uh, look, you know, look for those uh, different pages on the web. And remember to look for the other video where we're going to be clarifying some of your questions about um, applications I-765 and also I-765WS. Thank you again for um, answering our questions. Absolutely. And thank you all for watching. And remember, go seize your dream.